on this Thursday night. It doesn't matter if you're a male or female, you gotta be treated properly. Google employees around the world walk out in support of the women who work there. Will their stand lead to positive steps in the tech industry? The caravan is on the road again, traveling about 17 kilometers today to the nearest town. With the caravan in Mexico, Susan Ormiston travels a day in their shoes. As up ahead, the U.S. toughens its border to greet them. Because if that's what happy is, like, I don't want to be happy. And a popular new breed of art. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't, but this is an Instagram world, and art like that could be the wave of the future. This is The National. Two stories tonight highlight a workplace reality women know all too well and that men may slowly be paying more attention to. In a moment, we'll look at the specific kind of abuse experienced by women who seek public office. But first, two stories rooted in the tech industry, where for many women, jobs come at the cost of sexual harassment and where the price paid by perpetrators has been low. But employees at Google say it's time for change. The last straw, a reported $90 million payout to a departing exec accused of misconduct. And today, thousands engaged in a mass walkout, brief but worldwide men and women at 11.10 a.m. in every time zone that Google has an office in. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. This was one of the bigger protests at Google's global headquarters in California. But they started much earlier on the other side of the globe, from Singapore, Zurich, Dublin and London to North America. Support women and to protest the way that this company has handled sexual harassment cases. People are just, you know, becoming more strong and more united. Uh, I think, you know, social responsibility is really important this time for tech companies. Time's up. Google employees are calling for some key changes, including a better process for reporting sexual misconduct, public disclosure of harassment cases, and a commitment to end pay inequity. The worldwide walkout included Google's Toronto employees, and the CBC's Ron Charles was at their protest. The Google workers quietly filed out of the tech giant's main Canadian office into a light drizzle. Just over 100 Googlers, about a quarter of the Toronto workforce, took part in the walkout. They headed to a nearby park for a subdued rally to talk about why they walked out. For me, it's because I've had to hear about and watch so many people leave the company after experiencing mistreatment and harassment, and I've seen women be unable to get promotion until they wither and leave. Today's worldwide Google walkouts are the latest and most dramatic display of dissatisfaction at how tech companies deal with harassment and discrimination. Huda Idris is founder and CEO of a tech startup for personal health data. Before that, she worked at three different tech companies where she saw the way so many women in the industry are harassed and discriminated against. Every time it happens to you, you, you know, you, you read about them, you read about these stories, you never think it will happen to you. So every time I've witnessed it or I've been around it or I've been, you know, subject to it, I've always thought, whoa, didn't, didn't think it would happen to me. And it's always a little bit, you know, you're always a little taken aback. And then it's difficult to try to figure out what you should do next. For Googlers, this was next. She seemed eager, trying to jump in to offer her say, but she was invisible. Google employees in Toronto refused to give their names or do recorded interviews. Still, the mass walkout would be considered an extraordinary action by employees at any large company. Its significance was not lost on the participants. This is a really huge moment, and we should all be proud and excited to be right in the middle of it. But if this is going to matter, this has to be the beginning, not the end. It isn't clear what the employee's next step might be. It's now up to Google management to hit reply. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. So the reply for now seems supportive from Google's CEO, saying we are taking their feedback so we can turn these ideas into action. It's worth mentioning that a recent survey of more than 900 tech firms in Canada found that women make up just 5% of CEOs and that 53% of companies had no female executives at all. Numbers like that are just one part of the problem. But as Joanna Romeliotis tells us, they're also motivating some company leaders to come up with some positive solutions. 
a pinata party just because. It's one way this Toronto startup keeps its employees happy. Perks like candy and free beer are typical in the tech industry. It's the other stereotypes this company is intent on busting. I didn't know that the tech world was uh, as male-dominated as it is when I started. We got full cans of pop. Eva Wong is, is the co-founder of Borowell. Being a female and a visible minority made her an outlier from the start. Inspired her to help create a diverse workforce from scratch. But when a female engineer at Uber went public with her Me Too experience last year, Wong decided the company had to do more. As we grow, I think it is really important that we lay things out explicitly. Half the employees here are female. Oh, oh. And there's a zero tolerance policy for sexual misconduct, even when it doesn't happen here. When two employees were harassed at an industry event, Borowell confronted the man's boss and got an apology. I think that really showed people that we, uh, we acted in a way that was consistent with our values. <laughs> but swift, transparent action is still the exception. Sarah Saska helps tech companies diversify their workforces and finds the majority don't even have a clear policy on harassment or a culture that welcomes disclosure. Often um, comments and issues around harassment come to me. They don't feel comfortable to bring it to their exec or perhaps they don't even have a people leader. Borowell uses strategies like how would you feel if that happened to your sister to personalize its respect in the workplace policy. And managers schedule regular coffee sessions with every employee to foster trust. That practice has a competitive edge too. It makes people want to work here. I think it's really easy for lots of companies to put values on their walls, but not really to act on them. Cheers. Cheers. And in this unforgiving era of reckoning, doing the right thing is a demand that seems to only get louder. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Women are also taking center stage in the U.S. midterm elections. They're now just five days away. In fact, a record number of women are on ballots looking to make history. Democrats and Republicans have 235 women in House races this year, which is much higher than the 167 they had in 2016. The vast majority this year, more than three quarters, are Democrats. There are also 22 women nominees for Senate and 16 for Governor. But for all the reasons this would otherwise be a moment of pride, as Lindsay Duncombe shows us, life in politics is brutal. And the harassment and abuse already common in many women's everyday lives can get much worse. She's an idiot. Uh, you must be a child. You're not ready. LOL, you are a joke. These three women, all Democrats, are first-time candidates for the Pennsylvania state legislature. I don't even want to look at social media, and social media is a big part of campaigning now. And it, it's not one side or the other. My, um, my opponent's signs were defaced. Someone called her an NRA slut. That's not okay either. Like, this is about, you know, civility. When you see something nasty about you personally online, do you ignore it? Um, sometimes. <laughs> Some of them are hard to ignore. You're like, what? Yeah. like what, what is wrong with this? Like, why would you say that? The best way to handle trolls, according to this expert, may be to call them out. More women, I think because of the Me Too movement, are more emboldened to speak up and actually put sunlight. And we always say that sunlight, sometimes sunlight is the best disinfectant, right? Put that sunlight on what is happening to them in order to try to curb it and prevent it from happening to other people. When anonymous trolls told Rachel Hundley to drop out of her campaign or else racy photos would be published, she posted this. This website relies solely on unfounded accusations and slut-shaming. Fed up with all the comments about her figure, Missouri primary candidate Cori Bush created a hashtag, these hips. If elected, she wrote, all of this goes to Congress. That more but sometimes the harassment again, is the too much. World. We had vandalism at our home. We had a break-in that happened while we were sleeping. Kaya Morris was the only African-American female member of the Vermont State Legislature. She resigned in September because racist harassment online escalated into the physical world. These threats to tell me that there's no safe place other than Africa. It was far beyond, you voted this way and I disagree with you. But it's, I have a fundamental problem with the fact that you exist on this planet Earth. She too says the only way to stop racism and sexism is to tell her story. We need to be aware of these things and we need to um, 
we do need to call them out when we see them. Is there any specific area that you want us to The first time candidates in Pennsylvania today. know this might not be the worst of it. When we get to Harrisburg, it's going to be way worse. Their hope? So that they now, all win and end up in the gonna, state capital. Fighting trolls is easier together. And Lindsay Duncombe, know, CBC it's, News, it's Montgomery really County, fun. Pennsylvania. Um, now, with the midterms just five days away, the campaign is becoming increasingly aggressive. In a speech from the White House, President Trump vowed to crack down on asylum seekers and seemed to suggest there may be violent confrontations at the border. Anybody throwing stones, rocks, like they did to Mexico and the Mexican military, Mexican police, where they badly hurt police and soldiers of Mexico, we will consider that a firearm. Because there's not much difference when you get hit in the face with a rock. Now, those were not the U.S. President's first words on the immigration issue today. This morning, he tweeted out a new ad in support of Republicans and their stance on illegal migration, one that drew widespread criticism for being, in the words of some, racist. We're going to show you some of it, but we'll hit pause a few times to point out why the ad doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. The video uses the story of Luis Bracamontes, a Mexican migrant now on death row for killing two police officers in 2014. Actually, Bracamontes entered the U.S. twice, first when Democrat Bill Clinton was president, then, after being deported, he entered again when Republican George W. Bush was president. In fact, he was deported under both Democratic and Republican presidencies, and since he entered illegally, he's lived in the U.S. under both as well. The video then shows scenes like this, suggestive of the migrant caravan making its way to the U.S. right now. Letting the question hang, are there people like Bracamontes in that caravan? And that caravan continues to move, though it is still more than a thousand kilometers from the U.S. border. Susan Ormiston has been traveling with them through Mexico and has this glimpse of the people she's met. If only she had crayons. <laughs> But it's time to get on the road with thousands of strangers at 5 a.m. trudging on to the next town 60 kilometers away. This caravan is now a political target in Washington. While here, three weeks in, they're still struggling to get out of southern Mexico. And every day begins like this. As the sun gets up, it gets hot, and there are little people to push along. Jacqueline Cordonis's three-year-old begged her days ago to quit walking. She wouldn't, but she managed to get a stroller. Her family fled poverty and gang-related violence. Were you ever threatened in Honduras? Si. Yes. Si. What do you tell the children about where they're going? Este pues, según ellos, we tell them we're going to the U.S. Do you think you'll get to the United States? Pues, Yo confío en Dios y pues, Dios sabrá. I trust in God and God will know. She can't know that she's become a pawn in a political storm and what she needs is a ride. A plan last night for buses fell apart under pressure from the Mexican government, say the organizers. So it's each to their own, hitching on to anything with wheels going their direction. For young men, it's a game, not for families who pause and wait and get a special drink, a rare bit of joy. There's not a huge sense here amongst these migrants who've invested nearly three weeks already that they're going to quit. But with official support for things like transportation disappearing and with pressure on the Mexican government increasing, it's hard to know what the strategy is going forward, except for one step ahead of the next. Among the 4,000 walking, there are those using the caravan as cover. We've spoken to several, deported from the U.S. already. But Donald Trump's vision of vicious thugs and invaders, it amuses Albert. He says there's gangsters and uh, vicious people in this group. No, pues. La verdad, eso podría ser, o tal vez. The truth 
Could be, maybe not, he mocks. I assume there'll be background checks at the border, where he's heading. Along with scores of young men traveling fast to an unknown future. And Jacqueline, well, she finally gets her turn, pushing the kids up onto the truck, clambering up with that stroller to get going down the road to Mateus Romero, another unfamiliar town. The migrants pile off, clutching whatever's precious, head for an open field where they'll pitch a tarpaulin tent for maybe one night before they start the exodus tomorrow. Tonight, 4,000 people are crammed in that playing field. Every day, the caravans on the road, conditions are not getting better. They were diverted late last night from a more direct route to the next town because they couldn't get those buses. So now they're snaking along into one of the more dangerous parts of Mexico. With all the resistance ramping up in the United States, all the attention around this caravan has actually worked against it. So the question is, what's left? What remains for the people trudging along every day? Susan Ormiston, CBC News in Mateus Romero, Mexico. Let's take a look at some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National, including an update on that fiery crash that killed two drivers. Wow, oh crap. Hold up. Holy sh Police say the collision yesterday just north of Toronto was most likely the result of some sort of mechanical failure on the fuel truck. They say it was traveling westbound on the 407 and veered hard to the left, taking another car with it. They both ended up in the oncoming lanes. If uh, we had the votes that uh, were indicated today, we would potentially still be one vote short. That one vote short means New Brunswick may be about to get a new government. The Liberals have a minority in the House, and it appears tomorrow they will lose a no-confidence vote, and that will set the stage for a progressive, conservative government to try to take over. It's time for me to go, and I want to go peacefully and beautifully. A Nova Scotia woman, Audrey Parker, hopes her death today will send a message. She had stage 4 breast cancer and had a legal assisted death. She'd wanted to live longer, but under the current law, needed to be mentally competent at the time of the procedure. In an online post, she wrote, I couldn't take the risk of losing access to MAID and thus dying a very cruel, painful death. She's hoping the law will be changed to allow people to consent to assisted death in the future when they might not be mentally competent. The 2018 National Silver Cross Mother has been announced, and for the first time, the Royal Canadian Legion chose a mother who lost a child to suicide. Anita Cenerini fought hard to make sure her son received full military honours after his death. Her son, Private Thomas Welch, took his own life three months after returning home from Afghanistan. But since Thomas's death, I also especially think of the soldiers who have come home with wounds that we can't see and that they deal with every day. And for the injured, for the ones who've been displaced from the only life that they've known, for the struggles that they face. You can see more of my interview, the full interview with Anita Cinerini on Remembrance Day during our special coverage of the national ceremony and then later that Sunday night on the national. But still ahead tonight, it's Thursday. And that means at issue, the gang's all here to talk about Adrian Clarkson's spending habit. Plus, is it art or ego or perhaps both? Eli Glasner checks out a new Insta-worthy installation in Toronto that puts you in the frame. And examining the sales pitch behind food sensitivity tests. A marketplace investigation shows they may not work as advertised. Can't eat bread, can't eat bagels. These tests scared the crap out of me to put anything in my mouth whatsoever. I couldn't eat, I'd feel sick all the time. You know, and, and it was just, it was long, long hellish road. 
If it's not a food allergy, could it be a food sensitivity, an intolerance? Some companies are offering food sensitivity tests to pinpoint foods that might be making you sick. And while they've caught on, some doctors warn about reading too much into the results. In this week's Marketplace Investigation, Charles C. Agro takes a closer look at how the tests offered by two of Canada's biggest blood labs measure up. Desperate for answers to what might be causing her stomach problems, Laura Chapnick turned to a food intolerance test. Can't eat bread, can't eat bagels. A detailed report based on her results told her to cut 26 foods from her diet. Foods that same report claimed could be contributing to headaches, bloating, fatigue, even fibromyalgia. These tests scared the crap out of me to put anything in my mouth whatsoever. It was, it was here on, on the screen. Right? The test Chapnik took is provided by one of Canada's leading blood labs, Dynacare. And Dynacare is not the only lab in Canada cashing in on the food sensitivity craze. Life Labs has a food sensitivity test too. The reality is there's, there is no science to support the way that they're selling this. Dr. Douglas Mack is a pediatric allergy specialist. He says food sensitivity tests are being totally mismarketed and completely misinterpreted. What it is basically saying is that you have probably at some point in the last few weeks had exposure to any of these foods. He warns using a test like this to eliminate foods from your diet can be dangerous. You can do harm by ordering these tests and having your children remove these foods from their diet. We have kids that are coming in uh, with nutritional deficiencies, um, with failure to grow very, very well. More than two dozen health and ad standards organizations say food sensitivity tests are irrelevant and have never been scientifically proven. Marketplace asked Canada's two leading blood labs why they're still selling the tests. Both declined our request for interviews. In an email, Life Labs told Marketplace a test does not need to be diagnostic to be clinically relevant. And Dynacare wrote to say it relies on the expertise of the ordering health professional to determine the appropriateness of a specific test for a specific patient. Thank you. When her symptoms didn't improve, Chapnick turned to a source she trusts for help with what to eat, a registered dietitian. Charles Siagro, CBC News, Toronto. And you can see the full Marketplace investigation this Friday at 8 o'clock p.m. on CBC Television, 8.30 in Newfoundland. Still ahead on The National, move over infinity mirrors. Eli Glasner takes us inside Toronto's newest Instagram-friendly art installation, Happy Place. One, two, three. Woohoo! <laughs> See? It's yeah, happy. Yeah, it's yeah I yeah. will give you that. No, it's, it is strangely calming. Very strange. I don't know. Anyway, this is my happy place, Thursday nights with the Ad Issue Gang. It's the night of Gigi's past as Andrew Chantel and Chris Hall take on Ad Adrian Clarkson's spending and David Johnston's new debate commission. That's next. I am pleased today to announce the establishment of an independent debates commission. In order to put in motion fair, open and transparent leaders debates during the 2019 federal election campaign. All parties did not have the opportunity to choose the debate commissioner and to be a part of the process, not even a short list. This was meant to be straightforward. I'm confused why the Liberals again chose to unilaterally make decisions over how our democracy functions. It was a Liberal election promise to create an independent debates commission, one the party fulfilled Tuesday. But was former Governor General David Johnston a fair choice for the commissioner? Should the Liberals have consulted their colleagues across the aisle? Is it possible to create a debate process without partisan politics? I'm joined now by our At Issue panel. Chantal joins us from Montreal. Andrew is in Toronto. And the CBC's National Affairs Editor and host of The House, Chris Hall, is here in Ottawa. Good to see everyone. Okay, uh, Andrew, we're going to start with you this week. What, what do you make of the idea itself uh, that, it, you know, that we try to make this a little more neutral, that the parties aren't involved, that we get actual reliable debates, I think is the language the government used? Yeah, I mean, the general idea is absolutely one I support. What we've tended to do is to treat debates every election as if they had just been invented. Uh, they've been running them, we've been running them since the 1960s. 
Uh, but uh, we, we treat them ad hoc. There's this furious last round of negotiations between the TV networks and the parties, self-interested parties all around, mm -hmm. and more particularly self-interest where you know where you're at in the polls. If you're ahead in the polls, you want to have as few debates as possible. If you're behind, you want to have as many as possible. It was unsatisfactory from all kinds of perspectives, one of which is who the hell is the consortium, quote unquote, to be making such enormous decisions about a, a central feature of, of modern elections. So taking it out of the hands of the consortium, uh, regularizing the rules uh, out, away from an election period so there's, it's not as certain who's going to be where on the thing, all that's to the good. But they've bunged it up, in ter certainly in terms of the way they've executed it, in, in the ways that were just alluded to. Um, you know, why they had to pick the, the commissioner on his own, why they had to, to set, start setting rules without consulting other parties. Uh, this is the liberals, once again, the mask slipping. Uh, and the consortium, just so people know, it's, it's the broadcasters. Uh, the CBC is part of that consortium, although they're probably, I don't know if there would be one going forward under this, this idea. Chantal, what do you think of, of the idea, the, the principle behind it? I, um, I don't find the, that the idea is without merit, although I am uh, probably less uh, disquieted by the process uh, in the past. The, yes, the networks tended to get together and try to get the leaders to agree to come on their podium, but in mm -hmm. Quebec, one network has walked away from that process. And the only outcome from that is that there have been two French debates instead of just one, and I'm hard pressed to find that's a bad outcome. Mm -hmm. But it, in matters like debates, election laws, uh, electoral reform, consultation matters. Uh, and the process that led to this, the hand-picked uh, commissioner by mm -hmm. the government alone, et cetera, kind of poisons the well to start with. It, it is the, true, and I wrote this in our newsletter today, though, that the past two elections, 2008, 2015, have been dominated by, at least the beginning, by, uh, by about these debate debates. And, and it becomes sort of ridiculous that we're not spending time talking about issues, and rather, who should be on the stage, who's going to broadcast it, what's it, what is it going to be about? I mean, it spins into the ridiculous. There were five debates in the last campaign, two in French and three in English. Uh, two uh, dealt with specific issues, yes. one on uh, bilingual, one on foreign policy. I don't call that uh, an example that uh, shows you that you absolutely need to make, create a government appointed body. Well, it was that only the government is appointing to take over the journalism. Okay. Yeah. And then offer the product to the, the so-called broadcasters. Okay, Chris, I want Chris in, and then, and then we'll go yeah. back to you, Andrew. Yeah. That, that, is, that is, to me, the two things they were trying to address with this, Rosie, uh, the first is that they wanted to have a, an independent, less partisan-looking uh, debate structure, which uh, we all remember back to 20, 2015 when uh, the conservatives said they didn't want to be part of one by the broadcasting mm -hmm. consortium, and Tom Mulcair said the NDP wouldn't be at a debate that he wasn't at. So that was the first thing. I think the other aspect to this is that while I wasn't a huge fan of the long campaign in 2015, <laughs> I certainly liked the fact that there were five debates. Yes. The problem was that not enough people apparently saw them because they weren't broadcast nationally by the CBC and others. So this at least is a way to make sure that Canadians who live in r rural and more remote areas have an opportunity to watch the leaders as what Andrew has already indicated is probably the seminal moment in any campaign. Yeah, you, and you look, would hope. Yeah, go ahead. And, and there's an opportunity here in the setting of these rules to make them better. Debates can be terrible. They can be distortionary. They can give false impressions. We, we've seen examples of debates that really didn't work. But at their best, they can really be quite illuminating about the candidates and their platforms and how they perform under pressure, et cetera. And when you consider how awful campaigns are generally, they're just filled with tripe. They're filled with meaningless photo ops and attack ads and push polls and all these things. The best part of them is usually the best debates. Uh, there's an opportunity here, it seems to me, to have more regularized debates once a week organize the campaigns around them, gives us something to talk about in the media that we, rather than the stuff that we usually fill our time with. There's an opportunity here to make not just debates better, but to make campaigns better. And again, I think they've muffed it here because they're only talking about having two and again, one in each language rather than having them bilingual, which we ought to be doing in a bilingual country. Yeah, go ahead, Chantal, I see you want in. So uh, two points, uh, the fact that they're saying we're going to set up two debates, they're not forcing, asking, requiring any broadcaster to broadcast them. Or everyone so, to attend either, you don't have to show up. Yeah. Uh, no, but, no, but the, to the point of those five debates that a uh, lot of people didn't get to see because the CBC didn't carry them, I, uh, I hate to say this, but shouldn't 
the government maybe and the other parties ask the public broadcaster to do this? Uh, uh, would it be absolutely necessary to create a commission? And then I have to say that one fear, and I think it's a legitimate fear, is that the person who least likes to go on debates usually is the incumbent because yes. uh, he or she is under attack right. and it's rarely a great night. You don't win debates right. if you're the outgoing prime minister. You survive them. I fear that once you set that up, it will be easier for the incumbent to say, well, you know, I'm doing those two uh, commission-sponsored yes. uh, debates, and the rest of it, uh, I'm campaigning. Yeah. Forget it. And, rem yeah. and remember, the, the, the beauty of those five was that they were held in different parts of the country, out west, Toronto, uh, Quebec, um, and they had live audiences. So there was a real sense that uh, people were engaged uh, as, as they watched. And I, I felt that that was really good for all the candidates, and if it had not been for that, we wouldn't have had the kind of clear definition, particularly of the Monk debates on foreign yeah. policy, yeah. the questions around two-tier citizenship, around what to do with Syrian refugees. All of those things came out. So the format was such that we had a much more detailed, much yes. deeper debate yeah. on issues that really mattered, as opposed to if we go back to the two that generally are held in Ottawa and Montreal, yeah. and as a result, I don't think they get the same kind of debate. It's, and th that's yeah. the other question, if I very quickly, who is going to decide the fullness of these debates? It's clear that the questions and now the, the, the journalistic uh, might behind them will be done by whoever is the, 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 the winning bidder. Uh, but I'm concerned about whether then the commissioner gets to say, well, I, I want more topics in here. Mm -hmm. It seems to me he's open under this mandate letter to, to do just that. Yeah, uh, it's almost like you're lobbying for a long campaign there, Chris. I don't want to frighten <laughs> you, but okay, I want to turn, just change gears and do one go round on the issue of expenses for Canada's governor generals. The prime minister has announced that he is going to review this after it was revealed that the former governor general, Adrian Clarkson, has expensed more than a million dollars over the 13 years since she left the job. Here's the PM. Canadians expect uh, a certain level of, of transparency and accountability, and we're going to make sure that we're moving forward in a thoughtful way. Okay, I, I have to say, I read this National Post story in your paper there, Andrew, and I was pretty astounded. It, I mean, that the rule exists, but also that there's no transparency. No one knows how the money's being spent, and there's no uh, obligation to disclose any of that either. It's it's quite it's quite something. So, should it be allowed? Is the rule the problem, or is it the potential abuse? use of the privilege that's the problem. Andrew, you go first. I think much more the latter. Uh, n nobody knows what the money has been spent on, and mo most people didn't know that it was being spent at all. Mm -hmm. um, there's some suggestion that, that ex-governors general have some duties to perform after, the, after they leave office. Maybe that's true, maybe that isn't, I don't know. Uh, that would obviously be fair enough that they should be compensated for that. But yeah, it should be much more transparent than it's been. Uh, and the amounts involved, I know some people will roll their eyes and say, well, the amounts involved are trivial in the grand scheme of things of a government. And that's absolutely true. But the way you get to $300 billion budgets is by a, a vast accumulation of people looking the other way because it's just too, too, too small an amount to worry about. Yeah. So you have to set a culture that says that every dollar is uh, precious. Chantal, what do you think of this? I agree that uh, it goes to culture, but I also think that uh, the governor general is not someone who is performing his or her duty for a dollar a year uh, and under which circumstances it would be right to provide all of these services. This is someone who is occupying a position that is well paid and then well rewarded with a pension. I, I don't see how in this day and age you can justify the amounts uh, and the lack of transparency. Chris. She hasn't been the governor general for 13 years yeah. and is still ringing up yeah. bills of over $100,000. Just so people understand, this came out in the public accounts uh, documents, and you have to have spent more than $100,000 to be listed here. So she's the only one, Adrian Clarkson, who has consistently spent more than that. None of the others have. So to be fair about this, I'm trying to divide, do governors general, after they leave, have the right to have some help with the demands, the requests, the appearances that uh, continue to follow them? at least for a few years after they leave, versus Adrian Clarkson herself, who has been the focus, even when she was governor general, uh -huh. uh, of being a pretty big spender. And I think that's the big question here. If she is spending it, and it, this money, and it is on dealing with requests that arise from the time that she was governor general, then fine, let's see it. Then people will know the answer. 
but how many emails could you possibly be receiving that you need a whole staff to answer them? That's that's the question I don't know. And I, I should point out that uh, she is out of the country right now, the former governor general, so she hasn't actually answered these questions. But um, hopefully we'll get some soon. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast, for extra content. This week, we're going to talk about by-elections and why certain ones have yet to be called. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. And still ahead on The National, our moment of the day, maybe the moment of the year for Churchill, Manitoba. I just heard this noise that didn't quite fit, uh, but it was it was a familiar yet unfamiliar sound. And I, so I heard this, it was one honk, and both my mom and I kind of just perked our ears up and we're like, what was that? And then we heard it again, and we both looked at each other, and we both at the same time said, train. Tonight on The National, a story of survival in Arizona. A woman has been found six days after crashing her car in the desert. I believe we were put in the right place at the right time. I was glad she was alive and she was okay. Those two men rescued the 53-year-old woman who lost control of her vehicle. It plunged 15 meters before landing in a tree. She was severely injured and managed to make her way to a dried out riverbed and then collapsed. That was when a highway maintenance team found her after following her footprints. She apparently survived on grass and water. Brazil's new president is following Donald Trump's lead. He wants to move the country's embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Jair Bolsonaro confirmed the plan in a tweet saying Israel is a sovereign state and we shall duly respect that. The U.S. Embassy was officially transferred in May. Mexico has taken a big step towards legalizing cannabis. The country's Supreme Court has ruled the absolute ban on pot is unconstitutional. Now, that doesn't automatically make, make pot legal, but it's now the fifth time the court has made this ruling, and under Mexican law, that creates a precedent that other courts will have to follow. Officials in the incoming government have indicated they may make cannabis legal. Canada's postal workers are now on strike in 10 cities with picket lines like this in nearly every province. It is a continuation of the job action by the union. It's pressing for better pay and better working conditions. And the rotating strikes are now hurting deliveries. In a statement, Canada Post acknowledges there is a backlog of more than 150 trailers in Toronto, Vancouver and Montreal with items waiting to be processed. The company has said it remains committed to reaching a negotiated settlement. You may have seen pictures like these on your social media feeds last spring. The Art Gallery of Ontario is hoping to bring the Infinity Mirror Rooms exhibit back to Toronto permanently. They've launched a crowdfunding campaign hoping members of the public will help raise the money they need to buy it from the artist. But that's not the only immersive exhibit coming to Canada. Pop-up museums and galleries are showing up all over each promising an interactive and selfie-friendly experience. One just opened its doors in Toronto today. It is called Happy Place, and we sent our Eli Glasner to check it out. <laughs> what is the Happy Place? It's a confetti dome you stand in, a bloom room filled with plastic flowers, or the cookie room that has a cookie all dreamt up by a dad looking to distract his kids. I struggle to do two things, to find things that are positive to do with my children and just enjoy something that I can enjoy, they can enjoy, and just maybe take their focus away from some of the negativity. Hello, hey, how are you? And while they say you can't put a price on happiness, tickets start at 3250 But this influencer says it's all about the image. I think, especially with platforms like Instagram, it's really all about photos and being really visual. So it just gives you something new to share, something that's bright and fun. And people love seeing bright and fun on Instagram. That's just the way it is. <laughs> the Happy Place is part of a larger trend of immersive experiences. From the Museum of Ice Cream to the 29 Rooms installation, the popularity of galleries where adults pose and play offers lessons for more traditional institutions. If part of your question is saying, can we defend the old-fashioned museum, 
You know, it's all, museums are mausoleums. They're places of dead things oftentimes. So how do you turn them into places of living things? So that becomes more challenging to programmers and curators. If it's art, it's really bad art. <laughs> Although the happy place didn't put a smile on the faces of these future curators. I think what the happy place could learn about museums is, it, is it, uh, accessibility. And if we're saying like the commodified version of happiness is only accessible to to higher class folks who can't afford this. If that's what happy is, like I don't want to be happy. I don't want to think that going to my happy place is being surrounded by cookies. Like to me, going to a museum makes me happy, I suppose, in a way that's more profound. You know, you see things that are different than you and that's a challenge and you have to grow. And that's what art should be. It shouldn't be a perfect mirror. But the success of the Art Gallery of Ontario's Infinity Mirrors exhibit suggests in the age of the selfie, the public wants to engage, whether it's silly or sublime. One, two, three. Woohoo! <laughs> it's, 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 it's not, yeah, I will give you that. No, it's, it is strangely calming. Eli Glasner, right. CBC News, Goodbye. Toronto. I'm gonna just. I'm not a cookie guy either, but that uh, did look kind of fun. Okay, next on The National, plenty of people in Churchill, Manitoba called the train station their happy place last night. Jubilant, pure joy. Uh, there, was, there was people down there that, like me, as soon as they heard the, the, uh, the toot of the horn, raced down there as quick as they could. A lot of them were trick-or-treating with their kids and so everybody was down there to greet this train. The full story of the moment, the first train in more than a year arrived is our moment, but first. In case you missed it, Canada's newest architectural gem opened its door today in Calgary city center. And you might be surprised by what it is. Your new central library. <laughs> wrapped in wood outside and in and bathed in light. It even made Architectural Digest's list of top structures for 2018. This is the most fantastic, awesome building I've ever been in. It's super duper. <laughs> Number one, y'all should come down here. It just will blow your mind. If you think libraries are buildings with books in it, man, you are really, really off base. Complete with video editing suites, a concert hall, this is a new kind of library. There's even a children's playground. They're not gonna get shushed. No, as a matter of fact, we'll probably run after them and play with the toys as well. Two million people are expected to visit the state-of-the-art new library each year, one that comes with a quarter billion dollar price tag. The mayor says, worth every penny. Because every single person in our community, rich or poor, having been on this land for thousands of years, who arrived last week from a refugee camp, every single one of us deserves beauty, deserves dignity, and deserves a place to launch our own dreams, and that's what we're doing here. And just like that, Churchill, Manitoba is back on track. A train rolled into town last night for the first time in more than a year. Flooding damaged the tracks back in May 2017, severing the town's only land link to the rest of the province. Residents gathered in the streets today to celebrate the first train and got another boost when the Prime Minister made this announcement. The rail line is expected to resume its regular operations, servicing both passengers and freight by the end of November. This is part of a $117 million commitment from the federal government to both resurrect the rail line and Canada's only deep water Arctic port. Now, if you saw one video from Churchill today, it was probably the one Joe Stover posted to Twitter of the first train rolling through. And because we've got amazing producers, we managed to track him down and talk to him about his reaction to all of this. And that is our moment of the day. So I heard this was one honk and both my mom and I kind of just perked our ears up. We're like, what was that? And then we heard it again and we both looked at each other and we both at the same time said, train. So everybody was down there to greet this train and there was there were people that were in tears and they were crying. And for the first time in a long time, it was people crying tears of joy. Welcome back, fellas. It was a beautiful moment where everybody was just together and 
uh, the crew got off the train and people were hugging them and just watching it come in it, it, it represented jobs coming back to us eventually it represented grocery prices uh, being low represented gas getting low uh, price wise and just just a return to normal life and uh, everybody's had our back and uh, I just wanted just to say on behalf of people in Churchill thank you to Manitoba thank you to Canada for uh, for caring and we're uh, we hope to see everybody up here uh, on the train soon. So you, you saw that sign at a couple places, no, we're here. This is sort of the, the slogan or the, the motto they had come up with to remind everyone in Canada that they were still waiting. And you heard Joe talk about it. It's because the prices for everything went up, but their salaries didn't go up. And if people wanted to go to Winnipeg to buy things, it would cost a thousand bucks on a plane. So this is really, you know, an important part of how they live and, and this will be life changing for them. You know, I grew up in a little town, and when I go back home, there's just something romantic and beautiful about hearing a train as it rolls through, and you, you hear the, that sound of a train. So it's beautiful anyway, but to imagine that that is the link to the rest of Canada and how important it was to Churchill, very easy to understand the reaction there today. Yeah, just so people understand the context, I mean, this is a small town, right? Just about 900 people, and it was heartbreaking to think that while this rail line was down, there were people who left down for good because life was so difficult, Rosie, as you pointed out. But uh, hey, this is a pretty good feel good community moment. Uh, that's the national for this Thursday, November 1st. Good night. Good night.